Hello, everybody. Welcome, friends. Welcome back to the 10th and final edition of Spooky Story Tuesdays. Here with me, your host, Amelia Cotter, and this week's very special guest, Pepper, who is a Hog Island boa. I'm going to wait in just a minute so that people can get situated, and we'll talk about Pepper before I do any kind of reading or anything so that we can... Uh, what are you doing? Goodness, he's going to start climbing me so that we can make sure he's nice and comfy um, so that I'm not uh, disturbing him. So Pepper is our little special needs guy. He's the only one of our snakes who's a little bit more nervous than the others. He doesn't look nervous right now. He looks totally relaxed and he's just exploring his surroundings and being a cool little fella. Baby boas tend to be a little bit moodier than their adult counterparts. And he also um, has a bit of a, a history. We've had him for almost a year. He's almost two years old and he's very small. Uh, and he, he would only get to be about four or five feet long, uh, which is smaller for, for this, you know, for a boa uh, such as this anyway. But he, uh, he eats on the reg and just doesn't seem to want to grow very much but he is getting a new house next uh, week. We're actually upgrading all of our houses and terrariums for all of our babies. Um, and oh, there's Oscar in the background making an appearance. And uh, we also, uh, what was I gonna say? I know that Colleen and Sienna have been interested in knowing and learning about Pepper. So if you have any questions, you know, now's a good time to ask. So hog island boas are naturally hyper hypomelanistic like this. Uh, so you can see he's got this nice light color and he's got this um, speckling. So that's why we named him Pepper. Hog Island is off the coast of Honduras and it is a place where this population of regular mainland boas evolved into their own uh, type of boa. I'm not a scientist so I don't know all of the fancy words but uh, they were collected almost to extinction in the 1980s and have been brought back uh, in captivity. There's many more of them in captivity than there are still in the wild, even though they have made a comeback. And so he's a pretty special guy and we, we love him. He's just a little bit less predictable. Ugh, he makes me a little nervous sometimes. He's a little bit less predictable than our other Sneckums. Um, and he has bitten Jonathan once, just for everybody out there who wonders sometimes about uh, how moody our snakes are. Everybody's good. This guy, he's uh, a little bit less predictable, but it was really funny when he <laughs> bit Jonathan. It was an accident, and uh, we were actually feeding him, so he didn't bite Jonathan because he wanted to bite him. He bit him because he was, uh, he missed his mouse and went straight for Jonathan's hand and Jonathan just accidentally instinctively pulled his hand back and I was sitting on the floor doing my virtual banjo class when I saw Pepper go flying through the air uh, because he kind of like launched into the air when Jonathan pulled his hand back and then made a very safe landing and then Jonathan uh, promptly picked him up and he was totally fine and calm again. So. In any case, he's gorgeous. He's absolutely beautiful. And uh, yes, just wants to climb me like a tree. Um, Sienna is super glad to see Pepper again. Good, because he's glad to see you. He eats mice. So right now he eats fuzzies. He's going to graduate. Or does he eat small mice now? He had his first small mice. He eats small mice. So small adult mice about this big. And so we should see him growing some more um, now that he's getting comfortable doing that, he, he was kind of nervous around eating bigger prey for a while. And, uh, but one day he should eat rats. Does anybody else have any questions about our Moody Blues fellow here? When he gets older, he should get even calmer than he is now. Um, but he's still safe to handle at shows and everything. Uh, we take him and some, you know, we usually, I think I mentioned this in the last one that kids like 12 and up can, can handle him um, or pet him because he, he's a, he is a good boy. All right. You good to go? 
but he's not comfortable enough for me to like swing him around my neck while I'm, you know, reading books and everything like I can with the other snakes who are like living necklaces. So um, he just needs a little more work and a little more practice. Paul is asking what kind of noodle this is. This is a hog island boa. So he is a descendant of the boa constrictor constrictor, and they have their own population on the island of Hog Island, which is off the coast of Honduras. Okay, I think we're ready for story time unless anybody else has questions. All right, here you go, buddy. Now, now he's clinging to me. So first he was like, I don't know about this lady, and now he will not let go. All right, well, good boy. All right, and he has that beautiful red and pink tail. Okay, so this is it, folks. This is the final edition of Spooky Story Tuesdays. Um, I may uh, rebrand in the near future and come back with something else that won't be every week, but I might offer some workshops or do another book launch because I have another book coming out next month and some other fun stuff. So uh, this probably won't be the end of my Facebook videoing, and I... Um, plan also to upload all the videos to YouTube. So I'm not a YouTuber by any means, but I thought it would be fun to just have them cataloged there in case people want to go back and watch them again for all the fun posterity and everything. So tonight's lineup is going to be my ghost stories. It's going to be very simple. We're only going to read from two books. This is a very thinly veiled uh, advertisement for my, for my volume Maryland Ghosts, Paranormal Encounters in the Free State. Um, so you can see I have some stories to read to you from there. And I've got one from Scary Stories that has nothing to do with me. I just want to read it to you um, because it wouldn't be right if I didn't. So that's what we're going to read from. And let's see. My current reading that I enjoy sharing with you guys, with you folks, is Surviving Death. A journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife. This is a New York Times bestseller. Um, I don't usually read stuff like this. I'm really uh, fascinated. I just got through the introduction. It looks like it's going to be a lot of different stories chronicling different people's experiences um, with uh, either near-death experiences or kids who apparently remember, you know, details about past lives and things like that uh, from a reputable journalist, uh, Leslie Keen. So I've gotten as far as the intro. And then the other thing that I'm looking forward to reading afterwards is called The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. And uh, this is going to be a beautiful book of poetry and memoir and, and birding, bird watching, because we also love birds. We're in the Herpetological Society and the Ornithological Society because we're nerds. Uh, and I got to see Dr. Lanham speak at, um, at an event, and he's amazing. So this is by J. Drew Lanham. Right toe. All right, and a word from our sponsors. Let's not forget that. So we've got Scott Marcus on deck tomorrow with his stories. That's on Wednesdays at either 6 or 8 p.m. Um, at facebook.com slash what's your ghost story. And on Fridays, our friends at Haunted Galena also do Facebook ghost stories at facebook.com slash Haunted Galena. That's at 6.30 p.m. These are all central times. And then Sunday, um, what's the heck? What's the heck? That's a great uh, sentence. I always forget the name. See you on the other side podcast. That's at 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, and that's on YouTube, I think. That's youtube.com slash see you on the other side. Today, I have like 5,000 appearances going on. Uh, other than right now, earlier, um, I was on the... Um, the Grave Talks. So that's thegravetalks.com. That's a podcast, and you can see me. I'm the first one. You can also uh, listen to that on Apple Podcasts. And then after this, at 8.30, after a few more glasses of champagne, uh, I will be on the edge of the rabbit hole, and that's at youtube.com slash edge of the rabbit hole uh, with Mike Rixker and Vanessa Hogel, and that's always a good time, and Mike is my publisher at Haunted Road Media. It's going to be a blast. Do not miss. That's it, we're ready for stories. Do a little toasty toast. In honor of all of our good times together so far this spring and hoping for better times ahead. 
And yes, Sarah, I am wearing uh, this very familiar dress. And I also received a package of stickers today from a certain someone that I'm very excited about. All right, so let's kick it off with something that doesn't really have to do with my personal life because I was not raised by wolves, but um, that phrase did get thrown around at me a few times when I was a kiddo. So let's go to Scary Stories 3, More Tales to Chill Your Bones, and read the story of the wolf girl. That's the illustration, or one of the illustrations. Travel northwest into the desert from Del Rio, Texas, and eventually you will come to Devil's River. In the 1830s, a trapper named John Dent and his wife Molly settled where Dry Creek runs into Devil's River. Dent was after beaver, which were plentiful there. He and Molly built a cabin from brush, and near it they put up an arbor to give them shade. Molly Dent became pregnant. When she was ready to have their child, John Dent raced on horseback to their nearest neighbors several miles away. My wife is having a baby, he said to the man and his wife. Can you help us? They agreed to come at once. As they got ready to leave, a violent storm came up and a bolt of lightning struck and killed John Dent. The man and his wife managed to find his cabin, but did not arrive until the next day. By then, Molly Dent was dead too. It looked as if she had given birth before she died, but the neighbors could not find the baby. Since there were wolf tracks all around, they decided the wolves had eaten it. They buried Molly Dent and left. A number of years after she died, people began to tell a strange tale. Some swore it was a true story. Others said it never could have happened. The story begins in a small settlement a dozen miles from Molly Dent's grave. Early one morning, a pack of wolves raced in from the desert and killed some goats. Such attacks were not unusual in those days. But a boy thought he saw a naked girl with long blonde hair running with the wolves. A year or two later, a woman came upon some wolves eating a goat they had just killed. Eating the goat with them, she claimed, was a naked young girl with long blonde hair. When the wolves and the girl saw her, they fled. The woman said that at first the girl ran on all fours. Then she stood and ran like a human, swiftly as the wolves. People started wondering if this wolf girl was Molly Dent's daughter. Had a mother wolf carried her off the day she was born and raised her with her pups? If so, by now she would be 10 or 11 years old. As the story is told, some man began to look for the girl. They searched along the riverbanks and in the desert and its canyons. And one day, it is said, they found her walking in a canyon with a wolf at her side. When the wolf ran off, the girl hid in an opening in one of the canyon walls. When the men tried to capture her, she fought back, biting and scratching like an enraged animal. When they finally subdued her, she began screaming like a frightened young girl and howling like a frightened young wolf. Her captors bound her with rope, put her across a horse, and took her to a small ranch house in the desert. They would turn her over to the sheriff the next day, they decided. They placed her in an empty room and untied her. Terror-stricken, she hid in the shadows. They left her and locked the door. Soon she was screaming and howling again. The men thought they would go mad listening to her, but at last she stopped. When night fell, wolves began howling in the distance. People say that each time they stopped, the girl howled in reply. As the story goes, the cries of wolves came from every direction and got closer and closer. Suddenly, as if a signal had been given, wolves attacked the horses and other livestock. The men rushed into the darkness, firing their guns. High up in the wall, in the room where they had left the girl, was a small window. A plank was nailed across it. She pulled the plank off, crawled through the window, and disappeared. Years passed with no word of the girl. Then one day, some men on horseback came around a bend in the Rio Grande not far from Devil's River. They claimed they saw a young woman with long blonde hair feeding two wolf pups. When she saw the men, she snatched up the pups and ran into the brush. They rode after her, but she quickly left them behind. They searched and searched, but found no trace of her. That is the last we know of the wolf girl, and it is there in the desert near the Rio Grande that this story ends. I love that story. I say this about every story in the series, but the illustration fascinated me. Uh, the story itself fascinated me. And then later, I know there have been some like documentaries and specials and things like that that have come out about like uh, real life instances of, you know, things that are sort of similar to that. There she is. And uh, there's some, you know, 
YouTube videos and photos and stories that you can hear about things that, you know, things related to the idea of, you know, people, feral people and things like that, which I, I know it's a controversial topic, but it's always been interesting to me in sort of a true crime kind of way. Now we will move on to the self-indulgent portion of this, which is me sharing my stories with you. These are all the stories that uh, took place in, in Maryland um, at some point or another when I was either growing up or when I was in college. And uh, some of them have come up in past Spooky Story Tuesdays. And so I'm excited to be able to finally share them with you. Uh, let's see. I did promise the Point Lookout State Park story. And that took place in Scotland in St. Mary's County. During the Civil War, the land that Point Lookout State Park currently occupies served as a Union Army fort as well as prisoner of war camp and hospital for captured Confederates. More than 50,000 soldiers were imprisoned there in tents and about 4,000 of them died. Today the park is abuzz year-round with campers, hikers, swimmers, and fishers enjoying the surrounding Chesapeake Bay and Potomac River. But remnants of the Civil War and those who suffered remain including the original Fort Lincoln, a four-sided earthen fort constructed for the defense of Point Lookout and plenty of ghosts. I took a trip to the park with one of my best friends, Jen, and a couple of our other good friends in the late summer of 2003 when few visitors were around and it was chilly enough to wear a coat at night. Each of us was, and still is, a history and paranormal enthusiast. We planned to spend the night in a cabin and explore the grounds, see the Point Lookout light, the park's famous haunted lighthouse built in 1830, and go crabbing the next morning. We were already pretty familiar with some of the ghost stories told about the park, although ghost hunting was not really our primary goal for the trip. The lighthouse was surrounded by a fence and fully visible from the road, but was not accessible. It is said to be haunted by a woman in blue who has been seen glowing in the upper windows of the house. Those who have lived there or have had access to the building have also reported disembodied voices, flying objects, and phantom lights in the windows. In the park itself, sleeping campers at certain camping plots are awakened during the night by the sensation of someone hitting their feet, as if a Union soldier were still patrolling his prisoners and poking at them with the butt of his musket, just to check if the still ones are dead or only sleeping. One of the most disturbing incidences happens to visitors as they drive along the road away from the park. They look into their rearview mirrors and see the eerie solid images of Civil War soldiers marching or jogging in formation behind their car. It was a long drive from our hometown of Bel Air in Hartford County to the park. So when we arrived and got settled into our small cabin, we decided to take a brief nap before cooking out and exploring. It was around mid afternoon. Jen says that as she was drifting in and out of sleep, she could hear the distant sound of drumming. It was slow and rhythmic and constant. She heard it as she fell asleep and again as she woke up. Later, one of our other friends, Andrew, admitted that he had heard the drumming too after Jen asked us about it. We later learned that hearing this rhythmic drumming is another common paranormal experience in the park and is perhaps the somber echo of Union drums assisting the soldiers in their drills or urging on laboring Confederates. During our little nap, Jen also had another strange experience. She was sharing her bed with her boyfriend at the time. Andrew and I slept on bunk beds against the wall. At some point, Jen's boyfriend got up to go use the communal campground bathroom just a short walk from the cabin. She said she was awake when this happened and aware that he had gotten up and left and then heard the door to the cabin open and close again and felt him lie down next to her. At this time, I woke up and asked her where her boyfriend was. Jen turned to see who was in the bed next to her and found the space empty. He clearly hadn't returned. Interestingly, this was the last of the paranormal activity that we experienced at Point Lookout, but the residue of the ghostly, almost sad beating of the drums stayed with us throughout the trip. That night, we grilled out and told stories drove up to the lighthouse and waited to see the lady in blue, who did not appear for us, and explored Fort Lincoln with only flashlights and cameras to protect us, all without incident. The only other thing that could be considered anywhere near frightening was baiting the crab traps on the next quiet foggy morning with live worms and raw chicken parts. And that's a picture of whoop, Fort Lincoln. I distinctly remember that we were walking around with these flashlights and every few feet we would run into a giant spider web with a giant spider right in the light of the flashlight. And I think that was the scariest part. 
All right. The next story that I want to share with you, and these are not necessarily in chronological order, um, is going to be from the Pry House Field Hospital Museum, which is in Sharpsburg in Washington County. In September 1862, the Hilltop Farmhouse owned by the Philip Pry family in Sharpsburg was transformed into Union General George McClellan's U.S. Army Headquarters. This was shortly before the single bloodiest day in U.S. history, the Battle of Antietam on September 17th, the first major battle of the Civil War on northern soil, which claimed over 23,000 lives. Immediately after the battle, the house and the surrounding barn and property were turned into a field hospital where the wounded were treated. Union Medical Director Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Letterman practiced medicine and surgical techniques that, contrary to modern beliefs about medical care at the time, are considered to be the foundation of modern military medicine and triage care. General Joseph Hooker was among the wounded treated at the Pry House, along with General Israel Richardson, who was not seriously hurt in the battle, but was taken into the house to receive care. Richardson stayed there for the next several months, his wife coming from their home state of Michigan to be by his side as his condition deteriorated and he came down with pneumonia. He eventually died in the home after about six months. The house continued to be a private residence for many years until it was taken over by the National Park Service and became a stop along driving tours of the Antietam National Battlefield. It even housed Park Service workers for a short time, but for the most part stood empty until it was opened by the National Museum of Civil War Medicine as the Pry House Field Hospital Museum in 2005. The first floor is open to the public for part of the year with artifacts and exhibits, including lifelike mannequins recreating the scene of an operating table. Stories circulate about the house's resident ghost in charge. Not surprisingly, one of the Pry's or General Richardson, but Richardson's wife, Fanny, affectionately known to everyone simply as Mrs. Richardson. A lot of paranormal activity has been experienced by Park Service and Museum employees, volunteers, and visitors. People have reported multiple run-ins with Mrs. Richardson as well as with other spirits. I worked at the Pry House as a visitor services representative over the course of several summers while in college and heard a number of interesting stories. The most famous story told revolves around the fire that happened in the house in 1976 while it was still a private residence. There are two versions of this subsequent Mrs. Richardson sighting. The first one states that after the family safely got out of the burning home, firefighters saw a woman looking out of one of the second floor windows and ran inside to save her. When they got inside, they realized that the floor the woman would have been standing on had already collapsed. The other version of this story suggests that the sighting happened later during the house's restoration. Workers went into the house to search for a woman they had seen in the same upstairs window, only to discover that there was no floor up there for her to stand on. Either way, the second floor was completely rebuilt and people continue to spot Mrs. Richardson gazing out of one of the upper windows of the home from the room where her husband stayed before he died. She or another female ghost has also been seen in other parts of the house. It is not uncommon for a docent or volunteer to come to work at the Pry House in, in period clothing, and on various occasions, visitors have seen a woman in Victorian dress around the house. When they ask who the reenactor on site is, they are informed by employees that there is no such volunteer or docent that day. The Pry House was still being renovated for the first several months after being opened as a museum, and renovations to a home or building can often trigger or cause an increase in paranormal activity. During this time, some people were even approached by Mrs. Richardson up close and personal. My friend and former coworker Tina remembers hearing about the following frightening encounters with her. Once a staff member's son was in the main office on the second floor across the hall from the room where General Richardson died. The staff member later recounted to me that the boy was doing his homework or some other project and looked up and saw an angry woman staring at him from the doorway. Then she disappeared. I was actually in the house at the time, working downstairs, and I remember the boy flying down the stairs and out the back door. He jumped into his father's car, which was parked nearby, and refused to go back into the house. In fact, I don't think his father succeeded in getting him out of the car for the rest of the day. This boy wasn't faking it. He was really upset. Only a few days earlier, a volunteer was helping paint the house. He told me that he'd gone into the pantry in the kitchen for some supplies and heard, next to his right shoulder, a woman's voice whispering, get out. His description of the voice was that it was very angry. Now here's a picture of the Pry House.
As stated, not all paranormal experiences at the Pry House are with the lovely Mrs. Richardson. Tina also told me about her daily checks of the upstairs and the attic. When I first get there on my mornings and I went up to open the door to the attic, every once in a while a strong smell of pancakes and syrup would blast out. The first time this happened, I thought that somebody else on the staff had actually had a pancake dinner the night before somewhere on the second floor and the aroma hadn't dissipated yet. Other days there would be no smell, just the old dusty normal attic smell. The first time I took my son there, I took him up to the attic deliberately not having told him anything and as soon as we opened the door he said, wow, pancakes. Those familiar with my first book, This House the True Story of a Girl and a Ghost, will remember the sequence in the first chapter when the latch to the locked, unused door in the kitchen mysteriously lifts itself one afternoon in spite of being very heavy. This too happened at the Pry House. During the summer, I decided to get serious about writing ghost stories. That latch lifting itself made a noise loud enough for my coworker and me, alone at the time in both the house and on the property, to go investigate. When we tried to move the latch back into place, we couldn't, not even with all of the effort of both hands and leaning our full weight into the door. Something powerful had lifted that latch. I had one other encounter there during a previous summer. I was closing up at the end of the day and setting the alarm with my coworker waiting for me outside. As I was dialing in the code, I heard the loud voice of a man with a slight southern drawl echoing down the front hallway just 15 feet in front of me. It was as if he were asking a question, but it was so abrupt I didn't catch the words. I just stared and blinked in shock, and then my coworker asked me what was taking so long. I suddenly remembered that I had just a few seconds to get out before the alarm would go off when I opened the door. When I got outside, I didn't tell her what happened. I asked if she was talking to anyone or if anyone else was around. There was no one there, and she obviously hadn't heard or noticed anything. The parking lot was empty. The incident surprised me, but I wasn't really scared. The voice was so real and so ordinary. It didn't really hit me until I was on the road that it must have been a ghost. It was rather fascinating, really, to hear a voice from the past. All right, and we'll follow that up with stories from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, which if you ever get the chance to go to Frederick, Maryland, that is my number one recommended location to visit. All right. The National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Frederick County. A building that houses a vast collection of artifacts and lifelike mannequins performing medical demonstrations from the Civil War, conveying both the physical and emotional suffering of hundreds of thousands of people, is bound to be haunted. The National Museum of Civil War Medicine, founded in 1990, brings the his history of medical advancements of the Civil War to life and breaks down historical stereotypes about clumsy surgeons and careless treatments. Using eerily realistic mannequins and interactive audio and video, the museum chronicles in graphic and personal detail the nature of camp and hospital life and the rapid innovations in military medicine that are still in use today. The museum is home to the last intact Confederate surgical tent, as well as an original operating table, prosthetic limbs, and numerous other fascinating pieces of Civil War history that tell the story of what happened after the battles were over. The three-story facility in downtown Frederick was originally a furniture store owned by James Whitehill in 1832. Later, during the Civil War, Whitehill capitalized on the large number of dead soldiers being moved through Frederick by turning the building into an undertaking business, as Frederick was a large city at the time and centrally located along transportation routes. There was a great demand for coffins and headstones, and often the hometowns and states of the dead were too far for them to be carried the entire way. Whitehill created a one-stop shop for coffins, headstones, and the preparation of bodies on site. Rumors still circulate that Whitehill was a corrupt man who would steal back headstones he had manufactured, refinish them, and resell them to new patrons. He sold the business to Clarence Carty after the Civil War ended. According to legend, Whitehill's illicit activities were discovered, and he was run out of town. With such an intense history and layers of artifacts and personal items that spirits could remain attached to, it is no wonder the museum is known to be one of the most haunted places in Frederick. During my sophomore year in college, I started to volunteer at the museum and later worked as a visitor services representative there. 
In addition to being afraid of the mannequins and getting generally strange vibes in certain areas of the building, I once witnessed a row of books fall off a shelf in the gift shop. They were stacked one behind the other with their covers facing outwards so that when they fell one by one, the effect was like watching someone flip the pages of a book. I also recall that people would faint in the same area over and over near the surgery exhibit on the first floor. Now, I almost fainted there too when I got my tour, when I first started working there. Well, before I started working there, I was a volunteer and I got my tour. And uh, by the time we got to that area of the first floor, uh, talking about like how, you know, amputations were done and looking at illustrations, doctor's illustrations of how, you know, to cut different flaps into the limb and everything, I sort of like, Ugh. Um, so a lot of people would faint. Um, so, and of course my next sentence is, the subject matter could certainly get gruesome in various parts of the museum, but it seemed like more than coincidence that people would suddenly feel sick or collapse in that particular spot. You be the judge. But my experiences don't nearly match up to what happened to some of my former coworkers. It was not uncommon to pass the time swapping ghost stories, and some of the employees were more than happy to talk to me about their paranormal run-ins with the numerous ghosts rumored to haunt the building. The third floor is said to be the most haunted area of the building. Not part of the exhibitions, it houses the museum's administrative offices. My former coworker, Robbie, was instructed to go up there one day while the offices were closed and check on something. After he went up and completed the task, he got on the passenger elevator to come back down. Just as the doors were closing, he heard voices. Curious, he quickly pushed the door open button to listen closer. He wasn't sure if the sound of voices was a trick of the elevator doors closing. As he continued to listen, he again heard what sounded like the voices of two men holding a conversation in a back office. The voices were clear but low and the words were indistinct. He had just been back near that office and hadn't seen anyone. Holding the elevator door open with one hand, he turned the corner to listen even closer. He could still hear the voices and they continued not seeming to notice him until he felt the overwhelming urge to leave. Another former VSR, Visitor Services Representative Kirsten, told me even more frightening stories about working at the museum. And these are in her words. I was working with Gwen, a fellow VSR. We were sitting at the front desk in the main lobby one afternoon. The museum was mostly empty. Out of nowhere, we both heard a muffled, blood-curdling scream. It was comparable to the kind of screams you hear in horror movies. We searched the building and even stepped outside, but couldn't find a source for the scream. The sound was close to us, but muffled. We were convinced that it had come from inside the building. Another time, I was sitting at the front desk and heard giggling. I looked around and no one was there. The temperature dropped suddenly. It got really cold and the door to the desk swung open about three inches. Yet another time, I was sitting at the front desk with Gwen and Robbie when the temperature suddenly dropped again. Then what looked like a small cloud of smoke passed right by my face. Once I was alone on the third floor and the door to the emergency stairwell slammed even though I had propped it open with a very heavy box. I also remember hearing voices in the exhibits on the second floor when no one else was up there. After a while, I refused to go up to the second floor alone. There were also the occasional books falling off of shelves in the gift shop on the first floor. I always felt that I was being watched there. All of these events scared the hell out of me at the time. I would get goosebumps constantly and was always very uncomfortable. Another thing that I remember about working there was at the end of the day, after we had closed everything down and turned off all the lights, uh, we had to leave out the back door, which meant going through the exhibits to set the alarm and then leave out the back. And so basically it would be quiet and dark and you had a good 150 feet to walk to get out of there, but down these like this winding corridor. And I, as a grown up, um, would run. I would grab all my stuff and like run as fast as I could to the door, hit the alarm and get the hell out of there and not look back. Our coworker Gwen also weighed in on her experiences, including her side of the blood curdling scream incident. While I was working as a VSR at the museum, I worked Saturdays and Sundays with Kirsten. One day, there were a few people back in the exhibits, but for the most part, it was pretty quiet. We were working on our crossword puzzles when we heard a blood curdling scream from inside the museum. I checked the security cameras and the exhibits and no one had heard or noticed anything. We ran outside and no one had heard anything out there either. We were never able to pinpoint the source of that scream.
On another occasion, I was checking the security monitor behind the front desk. It would display in real time every room that a security camera was watching. The camera placed in the exhibit with the hospital flag was pointed at a wall of flip panels that had photos on one side and information on the other. I watched as all of the panels on the wall slowly opened by themselves and then closed again. Many of the volunteers at the museum would like to wear period clothing when they gave tours. One volunteer docent often wore full black morning attire. One day, the development officer at the time saw a woman wearing black morning attire pass by her in one of the exhibits. She called out, good morning, Barbara. The woman then walked through a wall and vanished. The collections manager at the time had a seven-year-old son who, would often, uh, who he would often bring to work with him. One day, a few staff members were chatting in the kitchen on the third floor and heard him and his son come up the stairs and walk down the hall. One of the staff members peeked around the corner and actually saw a man and child walking down the hall. Naturally, she thought it was them. About 10 minutes later, she called out to them, but they didn't answer. A few minutes after that, the real collections manager stepped off the elevator. His son wasn't with him, and he hadn't been upstairs or in his office yet that morning. There were many occasions when I was alone in parts of the building, this is my words again, or these are my words, uh, before or after hours, and I vividly remember scurrying as fast as I could through dark exhibits and down long empty corridors. I loved the museum and my time working there, and I never felt unwelcome, but there was a constant overwhelming sense that something else was there. Sometimes the simple presence of spirit energy causes us to have a natural instinctual reaction of fear when in fact the spirits mean no harm. Most of the time, the spirits just are. And in the case of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, they maintain quite a strong presence that is sure to be felt by all who enter. All right, let's do, all right, we're gonna read one more. This is not, necessarily a ghost story, but it is really truly one of the coolest stories that I have in my arsenal of stories to tell. Um, and I'm very excited to be sharing it here with you now. Um, it's called The Coffin Factory, and it took place in Jarrettsville in Harford County. The following story recounts perhaps my all-time favorite personal experience as a young and restless, <laughs> reckless suburban explorer and will most certainly be one of those stories my grandkids will have to listen to over and over or maybe your grandkids there was an old abandoned building beside the road near the intersection of route 23 and 165 in jarrettsville it was long and white standing tall and slightly crooked in its rundown state across the street from the eg kurtz and son funeral home which is still in operation and the building is still there because jonathan and i just drove by it in march it looked like an old fashioned warehouse and had trees and vines growing along one side. I drove past it for a couple of years, always wondering what it was, before some friends and I decided to check it out one night. We had never heard any stories about it and it was not on the radar of local lore. We had pretty much exhausted other Harford County possibilities, having been to many of the well-known haunted or abandoned sites over and over, so we decided to give this place a try. There were seven of us together on a cool, clear night in around 2003. As usual, we were all ghost hunters, history buffs, and fans of old buildings and interesting architecture. Jen and a couple of my friends featured in other stories in this book were present. We parked behind the building, away from the lit road where a few cars would pass by on the country road throughout the night. Armed with nothing but flashlights, we decided to go into the building the old fashioned way, through the front door. The main door was on the front left side of the building facing the road and it was locked. This struck us as odd considering the state of the building and the large hole in the door's window. It told us this was for sure not a frequented spot, just as we had thought. And here's a picture of the building. Neil, a veteran of abandoned house exploration and a remodeler of old homes, including abandoned homes, reached his hand through the hole in the glass and turned the lock. Yes, we broke the law. Don't do that. Don't try this, kids, at home. We opened the door and found ourselves inside of a large workshop with a mix 
of modern and old-fashioned tools and trash thrown all over the desks and the floor. There was a very old adding machine on the desk immediately to our left and a wall calendar from 1995 hanging on the wall behind it. Directly across from us was a stairwell that had caved in and on the right a doorway leading into the next large room. As we all stepped inside and got our bearings, Tiff scanned her flashlight over everything around us. The floor, tables, and objects were covered in layers of thick white dust. It looked like the place hadn't been touched in years. We had stumbled upon a real gem. Then she turned her flashlight up and shined it over the walls. We suddenly stopped and looked up in shock. On the far right wall were rows and rows of shelves containing small child-sized coffins. They were unfinished and crafted of light-colored wood that had already been sanded and polished and glistened in the beam of her flashlight. Of course, it made sense. With a funeral home across the street, there needed to be a facility such as this to do the manufacturing. I had just never thought about or been able to picture what such a place would look like or where it would be and couldn't believe anyone would abandon this building and just leave all of this behind. Amazed, we began to explore the next room. It was another large room with high ceilings and appeared to be the main workroom. There were a great deal more unfinished child-sized coffins and then several larger coffins in various stages of preparation. It was as if the work being done there had just stopped in time. At the end of that room was another staircase with lots of debris piled up in front of it and on it and a small room to the left. At some point, I heard what sounded like a footstep or two coming from the upstairs. I ignored it because this was all too surreal as it was. We were drawn to the room on the left and discovered that it had one single finished coffin inside of it, perched atop a stand. It appeared to be very old and the outside was covered in what looked like black or dark blue leather that was dry and peeling at the edges. No one dared to go in that room because the image of it was like something out of a horror movie or a fake haunted house almost like someone playing a bad joke. There was clutter everywhere in the building except in this room. One of my brave friends and I were dared to go in and lift the lid off the coffin. I went in, turned on my flashlight, and scanned over the top of it. It was barely as long as I was tall. I had noticed that with all of the layers of dust covering everything, we hadn't seen any footprints on the floor or fingerprints on any objects. But when I stood looking down at the coffin with my friend on the other side of it, I saw a single set of three fingerprints on the top edge of the lid, just where I would have reached down to open it. We both stood for a long moment looking down at it, and I decided I didn't want to open it after all. We may have been into abandoned house hopping, but I was a firm believer in not tampering with anything inside of them. We left that room and congregated in the main room where I noticed even more tools and all sorts of wooden planks, coffin lids, and coffin-shaped pieces of wood stacked against the walls. Suddenly, Neil put up his hand and shushed us. He was the group's skeptic, and if he seemed worried, we listened. Guys, he said, I think I've been hearing footsteps. We were quiet for about one second, and then the room erupted in whispers, all of us confirming that we had heard footsteps coming from the upstairs at one time or another too. Neil even remarked about how the footsteps had seemed to follow us from one side of the building to the other. But it was impossible for anyone to have been up there. The staircases were blocked or non-existent and it was obvious no one had been on the lower level for some time. We all quieted down and held our breath. After just a few short moments and as if on cue, Another distinct creep, <laughs> creaking came from right above us, like someone taking one long step. You guys, Neil said, I think there is actually someone up there, like a real living person. <laughs> With that, we scrambled to the front door and collected ourselves briefly. Neil was curious about something. Looking around, he shined his flashlight on the front door and spotted a light switch. You know, the door was locked when we tried to get in. I'll bet you anything the lights work too. I think someone is paying for electricity and that this place is still occupied. He hit the switch and sure enough, the main overhead light came on. Mortified, embarrassed, and disoriented, we turned off the light, threw the door open, and ran out of the back of the building, around the back of the building, to our cars. One of our friends had the courtesy and presence of mind to lock the door behind us as we fled. 
As we got in our cars, Neil was explaining, half out of breath, that in his experience with abandoned buildings, he had learned that more people squat in them than we think. They will even work out a deal with the property owners to pay for the electricity or water, even if the place is in total disrepair. Still confused as to how someone could access the upstairs to occupy it, not to mention be able to stay there alone with hundreds of coffins and coffin parts below them, we saw a dilapidated and unto itself abandoned looking car parked behind the house. Somehow we hadn't spotted it before, and there was also a ramshackle fire escape that made it possible, just barely, for someone to walk up there and access an upstairs back door. Our hearts raced as we left the parking lot, slowing down to look up at the front windows of the old building. There were no lights, no shadows, no signs of anyone there. We wondered if there really was a person upstairs, and if so, was he afraid of us? Did he wonder what we wanted? or was he just trying to mess with us? I also wonder how just those three fingerprints appeared on the top of that coffin with no other signs of human life anywhere else in the workshop. This experience certainly taught me an important lesson about safety as well as respect for private property and other people, both living and dead. Nevertheless, I treasure the opportunity to have such an amazing and unique story to tell. This building actually still stands and has undergone extensive renovations. Please don't go there and try to get in. It's easy to spot and photograph from the road, and it's heartening to know that this place has been restored for use again. I suppose it's always good to remember that when it comes to paranormal thrill seeking, sometimes there may be more than spirits watching you. All right, that was that. Those were the stories that I wanted to share with you from my book, Maryland Ghosts, Paranormal Encounters in the Free State. And I also shared a story from Scary Stories with you. That concludes our final session of Spooky Story Tuesdays. And like I said at the beginning, that doesn't mean that it's totally the end. Um, I've really had a great time doing these Facebook Live sessions. I've especially had a great time um, showing off the snakes. So I'm thinking of doing a separate Facebook Live snake talk with each of our babies. Um, and maybe the frog too, but we can't hold the frog, so I would have to like hold him up in something for you to see, but we can talk about them or do like a terrarium tour or something like that. Um, I have another book launch coming soon that will probably also have to be virtual. And then I've gotten some requests for some workshops, so some writing and storytelling workshops and things like that. Um, so that's really exciting. I have a lot of different projects that I'm focusing on right now. So I want to take some time away and rebrand and whatever um, before I come back and continue to do these Facebook Live sessions. So um, you can hear me uh, in just a little bit at 8.30 on the edge of the rabbit hole, which is at youtube.com slash edge of the rabbit hole. And you can also catch me on the Grave Talks. That's thegravetalks.com. Um, that podcast was uploaded today. And um, I think that covers everything. Let's do one more little toast to all of you and to a really fun time telling stories together by candlelight um, with my, of course, my always special guest, Mr. Oscar Bear lounging there in the background, and then all of our Sneckums and our Frogo, and of course, my fabulous uh, partner in crime, Jonathan, who sits quietly while I do these every week and helps with the snakes and helps me set up this whole rig and everything. So um, thank you all for joining me and until next time, cheers. Bye.